Spiritual but not religious. That which that. Let's try that again. Spiritual but not religious. That which. <laughs> uh, uh, spiritual but not religious. That's what we talk about in today's opening monologue on cross defense. Stay tuned. Hey, that music means it's time for cross defense. Every every week, coming at we're talking about theology. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. By the way, I'm so happy that you've joined me today. I've got a couple of things. I got something to get off my my chest, something to get off my mind to start out with. I, you you've heard people say all the time, "I'm spiritual, not religious." That phrase, that little bumper sticker of theology, that little attempt to throw off the sneaking. The sneaking around of God's law in the conscience. We're going to talk about what that means, what's behind it, what what people are getting at when they say I'm spiritual, not religious, and then and and how we can approach that. I mean, maybe maybe you've said that about yourself. Maybe you've thought about it about yourself, or maybe you've heard other people say that, your family or friends. And so we want to talk about what it means and and what we ought to say in response. That's the first thing. And then we're gonna I want to teach you guys a game. I teach this game to my congregation. Uh, to my family. I want to teach it to you guys as well. The game is called the Ten Commandments in the News. Oh, I'll teach you how to play that, and we'll try to play a few rounds together as well. So that's what we're going to do today on Cross Defense. But first, this. I'm spiritual, but not religious. I wondered the first time I heard this, my, probably was at high school. How long was that ago? 30 years? I can't, can't be 30 years ago. Back in the 90s, you'd hear people say this, I'm spiritual but not religious. And there's, a, there's an equivalent uh, catchphrase that we hear in the church, and it's that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. Th- th- those are kind of two sides to the same coin. Interesting uh, how that works out. But I want to I think about the pagan idea. I'm spiritual but not religious. And what does it mean? And now, now there's, not, there's some people who will just say flat out, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't believe there's a God that exists. I don't believe there's any reason to believe in God and so forth and so on. That's, that's what they say. But there's very, very few people who say that. We heard the, in the news the announcement right before the show started, this idea that there's a rise in people who don't identify as any religion. It's called the nuns, not the N-U-N-S, but the N-O-N-E-S. Those are the people who respond on a survey to what religion are you, and they respond None. I'm no religion. I'm not Christian. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Muslim. I'm not Hindu. I'm not Buddhist. I'm not, uh, I'm not anything. I'm no religion at all. But if you talk to these people and you ask, hey, well, do you believe in God? Do you believe in an afterlife? Do you believe in the eternality of the soul? Do you believe that there's, a, that there's something that happens after death? Most of them will say, yeah. They, they do. Do you believe in a higher power? Most people will say, yeah, I believe in a higher power. Do you believe in a, that this world was created? And, and most people will say, yes. It's an amazing thing. Most people have, they say, oh, I don't believe in any sort of religion, and yet I have the spirituality. I think that there's something greater than me. There's something out there that I came from that created me, and so forth and so on, but, but what it is or who it is is unknown. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the name of the thing that created the universe. I don't know the name of the thing that created me. And in fact, I think this is what people are saying when they say, I'm spiritual but not religious, because if, if you're spiritual, you believe in a higher power, but if you're religious, you believe in a God, specific God who has a name, or I suppose you could believe in multiple gods if you're religious, but there, it's a difference of, does your God, do you know the name of your God? Now, now just to, to sit on that for a little bit, this is very important for us to think about. That we, that we are able to identify the name of God or, alternatively, the name of our idols. I was reading this great little book, Me, Myself, and I, the, uh, Luther on the false idols of the, on the, on the idol of the Holy Trinity, uh, or the false trinities, that we, we are tend to worship ourselves. And this little book, Pastor Lockwood was talking about how, in the ancient world, you know, the old Greeks, the old pagan Romans or whatever, they had the names of all these different gods. They had Venus and, and Zeus and, and Mars and Baal and Molech and Mammon. They had names of what it meant to worship pleasure or worship 
lust or or worship money or or worship yourself or worship your own power or worship strength or whatever it is. They had names for it. And Pastor Lockwood makes the point that we worship the same things today. We have the same idols today, but we just don't know their names. We don't recognize that we worship our own security, or we worship our own pleasure, or we worship our own wealth, or we worship ourself and our own will. So, and so the disadvantage, Pastor Lockwood makes this fantastic point, is the disadvantage that we are is in the ancient world, if, at least if you used to go to the Mars temple and offer a, a sacrifice to Mars because you're worshiping, you're worshiping violence and war— and then you became a Christian, and you came over to the church, you at least had to renounce your idols, but now we don't even know the names of our idols to renounce them. So there's a, there's a thing there when we are spiritual but not religious, is that we don't know the name of our God, we don't know the name of our idol. These things are all simply abstractions. There's a higher power out there, but I don't know what to call that higher power. I don't have a name for that higher power. I don't even know how to talk about it. If you're spiritual and you're not religious, the other thing that happens is you get to choose your own ethic and your own doctrine. Religion, I think in this sense, means that that there's a dogma or a doctrine or a teaching that's there and it's established and it's in place. And so if I'm a religious person, I adhere to some sort of dogma or doctrine. But if I'm spiritual, that's not put in place. But make no mistake, the person who's spiritual has an ethic. And the person who's spiritual has a dogma. It's just not one that someone else told them about. It's a dogma and an ethic that they themselves invented. And I think in this way, we're starting to see what the game is. We're starting to see what is the goal of being spiritual and not religious. One of the differences between spiritual and not religious is that we're governed then by our feelings rather than a scripture. One of the marks of a religion is that there's a religious text. Just about every religion, I mean, that's one of the things that, that you do when you study religions. You say, well, what is the text that they use? So, so Christianity has the religious text of the Scripture, and, and Judaism has the religious text of the Torah and the books of Moses, and, and, and Islam has the text of the Quran, and, the, and Mormonism has all the extra Book of Mormon and all that sort of stuff. You you have uh, the Vedas for the Hindu doctrine. There's a there, in other words, there's a religious there's a scripture that underpins the religion. But if you're spiritual, there's no such text. I mean, not a standard text, not an authoritative text. I mean, you might go and read some poetry or whatever, or find some inspiration from something there, but there's no particular book to which you are bound. And so it's now not about your, uh, uh, the words that are spoken, but rather it's about how you feel. One of the marks of spirituality is it's all inside of us, and it has this, this mark, we're, and, and we are kind of obsessed with this. I don't, and I don't think it's just American religion. I think it's all over the place. We're, we're, we are kind of natively wired to reduce, the, to, uh, to reduce religion and our religious life to the inside, to the chamber of our heart. So we think that we think that religion is what happens on the inside, and, and, and the word that we have for that really is our feelings. So if you're spiritual but not religious, you feel close to God, or you're moved by these sorts of things. And really, when you're when you're spiritual but not religious, then you are the one who is the authority. You are the individual authority over your own spiritual life, rather than being under the authority of another and in fellowship with other people. Now, I think when you boil this down, if you have a chart, spiritual versus religious, and on the spiritual side, you have, you have a higher power instead of God, you have your own chosen ethic and doctrine instead of a settled ethic and doctrine, when you have the source of authority being your feelings rather than a scripture, and you yourself are the individual authority rather than being under authority and in fellowship with other people, what it really boils down to is this, that to be religious and to be spiritual and not religious means that you have a God who doesn't talk. You have a God who doesn't say anything. You have a mute God. Because as soon as God talks, now watch what happens. As soon as God talks and says something, then, you, then we know God's name, then we know right and wrong, then we have a settled scripture, and we have a text or a word to which we are held accountable. And that's dangerous for us. I mean, especially, look, especially if you don't want to be held accountable by a particular word. 
Now, if we take if we take half a step back to try to understand what's motivating someone who says that they're spiritual and not religious, what we find is this. Every single one of us has a conscience. That is, we have a heart. And in that heart, judgment is being made. Judgment about myself, judgment about my actions, judgment about the things that I say and the, that I do and that I think and that I fail to do. There's a constant judgment that's happening. And if that judgment is based on God's law, then the judgment is condemning me. It's showing that I'm coming up short. Because the Lord has such a high law given to us by the Ten Commandments, or even simply by the command to love by natural law, that, that word of God is, it, it is so high, it sets such a high bar that all of us have failed. According to the law, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know it. I mean, you know, if you're listening to me, you know it. I know it about myself. And you can know this about everyone that you encounter. You know that you've fallen short of God's standard, that you therefore are guilty, and that you deserve God's punishment. That's, that's what ought to come to you rightly. Now, that's a, hor- that's a horrifying thought, that when God would open his mouth, the words that would come out of his mouth would condemn me. They would show me my sin. They would show me my failures. And so it's better, it's better if I don't hear the words of God at all. Remember when God came down on Mount Sinai in the thundering cloud and he spoke and he boomed forth the Ten Commandments. Blah, and all the people said, oh, they were frightened and they backed away from the hill and they said, they said, Moses, you go up there and talk to God for us because we don't want to go up there. You go and listen to God and then come back and tell us. It's too horrible for us. Really, that's when it comes down, that the law is too horrible for us. So it's better to not have a religion, that is to not have the voice of the law so that I can be, so that I can stand as self-justified, that I can make an argument for my own righteousness, that I can somehow convince myself that it's going to be okay when I die and I don't have to face judgment. I'm spiritual, not religious, which means I've stuffed a rag in the, in the mouth of God to mute the voice of his condemning law. But dear friends, here's the real danger. This is the real problem with this whole thing. Because if I go and try to mute the voice of God when he tells me his name and when he tells me what's right and wrong and when he tells me his law, then I'm also muting the mouth of God who comes to tell me that my sins are forgiven. If I try to make God mute by this whole spiritual but not religious business, then I'm not going to be able to hear it when the Lord comes along and says, here's my son dying for you. I'm, I'm not going to be able to hear it when the Lord says, I, I've, given, I've given myself on the cross for your salvation. I'm not going to be able to hear it when, when Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Or when he shouts, it's finished, and when he breathes his last. I'm not going to be able to hear it when the preaching of the Scripture says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. I can't hear it when God says your sins are forgiven. If I, if I mute the voice of God that says you're a sinner, then I also mute the voice of God that says, says that, my, that, my, uh, that I'm absolved, that I'm acquitted, that I'm righteous, that I'm holy, that I'm beloved, that I'm created in God's image, that I'll be raised on the last day, that the Lord will welcome me into his presence with his kindness and his mercy and his love. I, I silence that voice also, you see? And this is the point of religion, at least the Christian religion, is that God speaks, and when he speaks, he speaks both in law and gospel, both in condemnation and in freedom, both in in accusation and in acquittal, that he speaks to show us our own sins so that we know our need for the Savior, and then he lavishes us with his mercy and his kindness in the forgiveness of sins. So we have to, wa- we have to watch out for this, this kind of trap that that people are setting for themselves of being spiritual and not religion, being spiritual and not religious. Because it's precisely in the religion of the prophets and the apostles, in the religion of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have the forgiveness of sins. So, if we're there, we've got to ask the question, how do, we, how do we speak to our friends and our family who say, I'm spiritual but not religious? I always think the best tactic in these conversations is try to make sure we can get on the same page and, and speak the same language. We can say, well, what do you mean by spiritual, and what do you mean by religious? Most people want by spirituality to mean they have this sort of direct connection with the divine, but we know this is dangerous. No one can look on the face of God and live, but to recognize that in Christ, God has made a way for us to stand before him in glory. 
So what do you mean by spiritual, and, and what do you mean by religious, and what do you think the Bible says about religion? What do you think the main point of the preaching and the life and the death of Jesus is? And I think these might be little cracks, little cracks to speak law and to speak gospel, to, to, to press the voice of God through the rag with which they are trying to mute it, to press it into their ears, into their hearts, and the with the hope that the Holy Spirit will make it bear fruit. I hope this is helpful anyways. We are not spiritual. We are religious. We confess what God, that God has spoken, and we confess what God has spoken, that he's spoken that we're sinners and that we're died for by Jesus. <laughs> God be praised for this religion. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. You're listening to Cross Defense. Let's go to the break, and we're going to play Ten Commandments in the News on the other side, so stick with me. We'll be right back.